previously on Research Rank Repeat. He was also, like, kind of creepy. Like, he left a note, and it was like, you forgot something. But it, like, yeah. I, in my head, I heard it as, like, Liam Neeson, like, good luck. Like, I heard it, like, as, like, a murderer. I thought it was weird they called it friendship, because it definitely was more than friendship. Friendship, in quotes. Definitely was a um, relationship. What a wild movie. I forgot I also should mention that this was intended to be um, Hayao Miyazaki's retirement from filmmaking. Yes. And a lot of people mentioned that it seemed like, it felt like a retirement film. Like right. It felt like he was taking a bow. He said, um, you thought. And he said, guess what, bitch? Psych. <laughs> I'm back. It's a little too long. And it's a little messy in the middle. I think the plot drags a little bit mm-hmm. in the middle of the movie. But my god, if this isn't some of like the best animation I've ever seen yeah. in my life. The music was really good, the animation was really good, the ending was unexpected and not how endings usually go, which was kind of a nice twist. Scenes and, where yeah. they held hands. Yeah, dance, I've they never danced held, together. I've never held Ruth's hand like that before. Never. I'm just saying. <laughs> The animation, Alyssa said it looked like Jimmy Neutron animation. It looks like Jimmy Neutron, yeah. It was rough. It's 2023, baby. We got a 2D animated film coming out. (laughs) Yeah. Like, can you imagine if this had been their actual last film? Yeah. Insane. Like, if Cars 2 was the last film Pixar ever put out, like, that's sour. We have finally caught up. We've watched 20... We've watched 23 movies. Hannah, how do you live? One mile at a time. (laughs) Welcome. This is Research Ranker Pete. I'm your co-host, Alyssa. This is co-host Hannah. And today we have a very special episode. It's finally the end of our Ghibli movie ranking. We made it, Hannah. We did it. We did. We finally saw every film the studio has to offer. For the most part, we excluded one that they did in partnership with another studio, but that's not important. We're not here to talk about that today. What we're here to talk about is the newest film from the studio, The Boy and the Heron. But previously also, originally was known as How Do You Live? That's why I asked you, How Do You Live, Hannah? Ah. Yeah, that was... I went the Vin Diesel Fast and Furious route. Yes. I think I messed up the line, too. Yeah, I think you did. Quarter mile at a time, yeah. How dare you besmirch the family this way, Hannah. But yeah, that was the original. I think that's like the literal translation of the Japanese title is How Do You Live, which is also the name of a book, which we'll talk about. Yeah. But yeah, Hannah, we went to those theaters. We did. Yeah. We did. It's been a bit since we've gone for a podcast. Yeah, I think... (laughs) <laughs> Fast and the Furious? Dare I, dare I say? Yeah. Or was it Elemental? It might have been Elemental. Hmm. I think Elemental was later. Yeah. I think it was. Yeah. It's been, but it's still been about a couple six months. months. Yeah. It's always interesting to see the movies in theaters because I feel like when we went, the first movie we had seen since COVID was Fast and the Furious <laughs> 9. Yeah, Fast it was 9. nine. Yeah. And I think we both like, Maybe overhype the movie because of that, because oh. it was just like being in theaters is a different experience. For sure. And we've never seen a Studio Ghibli movie in theaters. No. Until it's, uh, this one. It's interesting because they didn't really do theatrical releases Mm-mm. of or they their did limited. earlier movies, and they did some limited, and they kind of did. I feel like Secret World of Arietti was probably the largest US release that we had previously got before now. Right. Because we. Had multiple theaters in our state that offered this film multiple times. Yeah. Um, and there was a pretty decent number of people in the theater we went to. Yeah. It wasn't we full week- by any means. We went the weekend after it came out, like the following weekend. And yeah, it was pretty, I mean, it was at least halfway filled, maybe yeah. three quarters. 
we are currently recording this on the 19th. Um, the yeah. film came out on the 8th, 8th or 9th, yeah. I believe, was the U.S. release date. So we mm-hmm. were we saw it a week after it, it had released. Yeah. And so to have that amount of, of people seeing it still mm-hmm. on, like, a limited release window in international film yeah. is pretty good. Yeah. And we'll get into pretty some good. more of those numbers because it's, it's got some – we've got some interesting numbers on this film, Hannah. Yeah, I've heard some early – things about the numbers but we will see that was very early on that was like the opening weekend yeah every time i thought i got to the end of recording the background for this film i just kept getting more and more but yeah are you ready to get into some background Hannah, about this film sure. okay so the boy that in the heron which i already said release year 2023 now <laughs> the time 124 minutes the rating PG-13. We're back to PG-13. I don't think we've had a PG-13 rating since Princess Mononoke? Maybe. Let me look. I'm curious. PG, G... Uh, Tales from Earthsea was PG-13. So oh, okay. Last time we had a PG-13 movie was Tales from Earthsea. But they're not far, far and few in between. They don't happen very often. So this film, um, or as I mentioned a little bit earlier, was originally called How Do You Live? It is an animated fantasy film written and directed by Hayao Miyazaki. He's back, out of retirement, doing another feature film. He said he, he'd be done. He said he he'd said never come back. He thought I was gone. <laughs> they literally closed down the whole studio. But they're back. They're here. The title of the film, How Do You Live, references the 1937 novel of the same name by Genzaburo Yoshino. The f- book itself does not share any story with the film. The name itself is where the inspiration is drawn from. I didn't write down the exact numbers because, again, the background just kept going. But apparently this this novel is like on back order everywhere like everyone's trying to buy this book and they've had to reprint it like a ton of times and it's now i think it's sold like 1.8 million copies or something like that with for book released in 1937 that's right pretty crazy just just from this movie alone like the call for it so miyazaki uh and i say this in quotations retired in night two retired in 2013 and he said he was done. And, you know, he was doing a little bit of work on a um, short film called Borrow the Caterpillar, which ended up releasing in 2018. But when he was working on it, he was like, you know what? I think I'm going to come back out of retirement and make a new film. So in 2016, he started to um, storyboard and plan for a new animated feature film. And then it started to actually be in full production in 2017. And the goal was that Miyazaki wanted it to be released around the time of the Tokyo Summer 2020 Olympics that were being held in Japan. But they didn't have like a strict set uh, deadline. Uh, Clearly, that didn't happen as this film has now come out in 2023. Also, COVID had a big impact on the production schedule. Um, as it did with a lot of things, so that's not surprising. I wrote down in parentheses, COVID oops, you know, a little oopsie. But it is one of the most expensive films produced in Japan and potentially the most expensive film. I couldn't find an actual number amount on how expensive this film was, but um, Toshio Suzuki, who's the longtime producer, he has claimed that it's the most expensive Japanese film. So I'm going to believe that. Yeah. And it's interesting because um, something that they decided to uh, to do to finance this film is uh, release their movies on streaming services. Because previously, um, you, they didn't do that. They hadn't released any films through streaming. You could only get them through, like, physical media. Miyazaki's not, apparently not on uh, the apps. He's not on the smartphone. It's not online. He doesn't really know anything about streaming. So Suzuki had to apparently convince him that they should do this, that they should, you know, let people license their movies so then they can uh, get money from it. And he was like, okay, sure. Uh, That's why they're on HBO Max. How we were able to watch them. So I guess thank you for doing that. Otherwise, we would have not been doing this. So uh, thank you for needing to finance your film. Yeah. Just an, an, an anecdotal thing that I um, 
I read in a different article, uh, most of the information I gathered was through Wikipedia, one of our most trusted sources. But I was reading a different article um, a couple days ago that said that initially when Miyazaki was creating the idea for this film, he, because uh, a lot of it is kind of somewhat autobiographical, like he draws inspiration from his own life into the film. But he initially wanted the story to be about two two boys, basically mimicking his relationship with Aisao Takahata, who was another longtime friend and collaborator and director through the studio. Um, unfortunately, he passed away in 2018 while this film was in production. So I think uh, Miyazaki changed, ended up changing the story because of that. Because the studio had closed, they had to ask a lot of their past collaborators and animators to come back because a lot of people um, had moved to different studios or had formed their own studios. Like, I think the director who did, um, I believe it was Arietti and um, when Marnie was there, had created a new studio. I think we talked about that in the last episode. Joe Hisaishi has come back to do the soundtrack, a longtime Miyazaki collaborator. Um, he's back doing his thing, uh, you know, hanging out. Yeah. So this film was released in Japan in the July of this year, 2023. And one of the noteworthy things about this is that there was almost next to no promotion or advertising for this film. They released one poster that was a uh, drawing uh, with the title of the film, How Do You Live? I believe a release date. And that's it. They didn't release any cast information. They didn't release any plot synopsis. They didn't release any images. No trailers, nothing. One poster. And the reason this is interesting and why they decided to go this route is because they wanted to let the movie speak for itself, was said. And also, clearly, just from having done this and doing the background, is that the studio has a reputation for being the studio that it is. Hayao Miyazaki has a reputation for the director he is, and it already has an existing fan base that they would figured would come see these films. So they just decided to go that route. Something that I read while we were doing it is that uh, Miyazaki, when he was in his prime and he was younger, he could do um, roughly about 10 minutes of animation per month. So could work at a speed to do about 10 minutes a month. Now he does about a minute a month. So his part of the reason also for a longer work schedule is that um, his like timeline is s- slowed from what it used to be. Um, and so he used to also um, oversee every frame of, of every movie he worked on. But he became more hands-off for this one. So he mainly focused more on the storyboarding, on the overall art direction, the writing. And animated and the animation director Takahashi, or Takeshi ha- uh, Honda took over like the animated process. So uh, Miyazaki was a bit more hands-off. And part of that's due to his age. Part of that's just due to him wanting to focusing on the story he wanted to tell. And this time, interestingly enough, uh, because we talked about Disney a lot, holding the distribution rights for the English release of this film, they don't have it anymore. Now it is uh, distributed by G-Kids, is the new, uh, yeah. the new distributors of that English dub. And so um, the studio, Studio Ghibli gave them permission to do whatever promotion they wanted to do so for the actual english release uh they released one teaser trailer that i didn't watch before the film but if you wanted to see it you could but they also didn't do that much other promotion other than like announcing the the voice cast the english voice cast and then having this trailer come out it became the first animated film to open um the toronto international film festival that was the first time in history that that had happened um earlier this year and it was also currently has been nominated for a Golden Globe for both Best Animated Feature and Best Score, pending as those Golden Globes have not ha- yet happened mm-hmm. uh, for this year. I believe they're held in January, I think. Maybe. I believe it's January. I think everything happens. I know like- um, because of COVID, the actual schedule like shifted quite a bit because it used to be a lot more focused on the front half, like January, yeah, January February. 7th. January 7th. Okay, so find out in a couple weeks. So you'll find out. Maybe they'll have won some Golden Globes by that point. Yeah. On its opening weekend, when it released in July, uh, it had an opening of 1.83 billion yen, which is about $13.2 million dollars. 
It was Studio Ghibli's biggest opening weekend since Howl's Moving Castle and even surpassed Mm -hmm. that. Currently, because it's still in the theaters, or I don't know if this is also just because of international release, but currently it has uh, grossed 8.64 billion yen as of like in December in Japan, which is really good. It was Mm -hmm. in the top 10 for I think 13 weeks in a row is what I read. As of December 18th, it has uh, made 54, oh, 54 million dollars in the U.S. and Canada, so North American box office, and it has amassed uh, one, 112.8 million dollars worldwide. It is the first original anime film or and Miyazaki film to be number one in the box office. This is both for U.S. and um, Canada. And it made uh, $12.8 million its first weekend in the U.S., which is almost as good as the amount of money it made in its own opening weekend in Japan, which is crazy. Like, that Mm -hmm. says a lot. The fact Mm -hmm. that it almost made the amount of money it made, like, in its own home country where it's produced and and targeted, like, for. So it's doing really well. Like, it's doing exceptionally well in the box office. Um, I think this is the widest release the studio has had of an internationally for one of their films. And I think that plays a big part into it, um, as well as, um, I know some people were talking about their marketing decisions, like how they didn't do, I mean, they basically did no promotion, yet people are seeing the film and seeing it in theaters and seeing it internationally, and I think that speaks a lot to the studio and to, like, Mm -hmm. Hayao Miyazaki, that it's doing that well. Right. Currently, it has a um, 96% on Rotten Tomatoes, Metacritic score of 92 out of 100, 7.7 out of 10 on IMDb, and a 4 out of 5 on Letterbox. I was having a reading hard time understanding some of the things they were saying about critical stuff, but apparently the critical reception initially was mixed, but shifted to become mostly positive and critically acclaimed. It seems like it's just positive. So I'm not sure where that, like, at what point it was mixed responses to shift to be mostly positive. And, you know, I I don't know where that occurred. I was trying to figure out, like, what happened and when that shift occurred. Because I was like, the movie's only been out six months. So it's, yeah, you know, would have, I guess, had to have shifted pretty quickly. But, yeah, so it's it's doing, it's very critically acclaimed. It's doing well review-wise. Hello, everyone. Just a quick little update as we recorded the initial episode in November, December, December of 2023. It's now February. We're getting ready to put the episode out soon. So we wanted to update with some, uh, we wanted to update with some new numbers for the film. Yes. So as of now, mid-February. Uh, Boy and the Heron currently has a 91% on Metacritic, a 4 out of 5 on Letterboxd, a 7.6 7, 7. out of 10 on IMDb, and a 97% on Rotten Tomatoes. Which is essentially the exact same as was it, what it was when we recorded, but it has changed slightly. So. Right. And currently now has um, gross $166 million in the box office. Which is a lot. Yes. It is a lot. Yeah. Um, It also has won a Golden Globe for Best Anime Feature, which is the first Ghibli movie to be nominated um, and first win for Hayao Miyazaki. Which is crazy to me. Hannah and I were talking about this earlier that I didn't realize they'd never been nominated for a Golden Globe. But I I think generally the Golden Globes hasn't been very, um, like, hasn't had a lot of international... um, Recognition previously yeah. is a lot more U.S. based than something like the Oscars is. Well, it also started the category started in two thousand seven. So you think of some of the films that potentially could have been nominated were way before that. True. Yeah. yeah. Um, it also has been nominated for an Academy Award for Best Animated Feature and a BAFTA Award for Best Animated Feature. Both are uh, have not occurred yet. So yeah. we don't have any. We don't know yet. It still, will be a mystery. Yes. Yes. But yay, congrats on them winning a Golden Globe. That is fun. Good yeah. for them. I think they deserve it. Yeah. And back to our regular episode. Yeah, going back in time. Ooh. 
just another a tidbit of, of fun that I thought might be interesting to note is that Christian Bale is a voice in this film. Um, he was previously in Howl's Moving Castle playing the voice of Howl himself. The Japanese voice actor for Howl, who is, uh, I spilled tea on his name, so I apologize if that's not his correct name, Takaya Kimura, who was the voice of Howl, also voices the same character that Christian mm. Bale does in the English version of, of The Boy and the Heron. So they played the same character twice. So I thought that was kind of fun that that's they were like, yeah. they're like, clearly the character is supposed to be like the same type of, I guess, voice that they were like, hey, why don't you play this role again? have you voiced the same role that you previously did. So I thought that was fun that, like, I don't think it happens very often that international versus a domestic, like, voice actor playing two roles, like, the same role as their counterpart. I don't think it happens very often. So I just thought that was a fun information to take in. So that man and Christian Bale must be, like, twins. It must be. Maybe they're both Batman. Who knows? So normally we have our summaries read from Max, which is HBO's streaming service. However, because this movie is currently in theaters and not streaming and probably won't be streaming for who knows how long, I have found a review on Google, uh, our summary on Google that I'm going to read now. Mahito, a young 12-year-old boy, struggles to settle in a new town after his mother's death. However... When a talking heron informs Mahito that his mother is still alive, he enters an abandoned tower in search of her, which takes him to another world. I still don't know how I feel about this movie. I'm so confused. Yeah, because I teared up. I did too. A a little bit, and... But my problem is that I think it was good, but also it... I'm already having a hard time remembering some of the movies. So I'm like, is it forgettable? Like, that's where I'm having this. Yeah. This, because I didn't write notes in the theater and I didn't write notes that night because I just wanted to like Mm -hmm. process it. And by like the next day or the day after when I went to write notes, I was like, I don't remember a lot of the scenes. So I don't know. I, I definitely felt something. Yeah. I think it's really interesting because... As we've been going through the studio, a lot of the earlier films that I saw as a child, revisiting as an adult and a second watch through, I think was really nice and like being able to look at it in a different way. And I really think this film would really benefit me to have a second watch through of it, Mm -hmm. but it just came out. So I'm like, I feel like this movie could really change, like my perception of this movie could really change on a second watch through because I think- There were a lot of things that stood out to me as really, really interesting. Like, I really liked some of the animation choices. Like, there's a kind of an ongoing theme of, like, uh, Mahito's the main character has lost his mother in a fire. And the way they, like, animate, like, the fire and, like, shadowy mm-hmm. figures, like, because he dreams about, his nightmares about that. The opening scene is, like, him running through a crowd. And, like, some of the animation choices I thought were really interesting and kind of mm-hmm. different from what we had seen previously. Um, at least from Miyazaki himself. I felt like a lot of elements came from his previous films. Like, I thought it brought mm-hmm. together, like, a lot of things that we had kind of seen. And, like, things from Spirited Away, things from Howl's Moving Castle... Things from, like, My Neighbor Totoro. Yeah. And it's and it's, it's hard. Like, I feel like the problem for me is that I don't really know how I feel about it. I don't yeah. feel negatively. Mm-mm. I don't feel like, wow. Like, it definitely, like, left an impact. And I thought it was a well-done movie. But I feel like maybe i think i know what my issue is is that this movie's focus is really not on plot like Mm -hmm. the plot is not like a straightforward like a straightforward story i feel like it's a lot more about the journey like what i don't know themes or like what messages you can draw from that because if it really feels like very personal i didn't include in the background because i didn't think it was necessarily like Part of it, but people have said, like, it's, you know, Miyazaki, we talked about with my neighbor Totoro, like, his mother was sick a lot when he was younger, so, Mm -hmm. like, this, um, having a a death of a mother young, like, having this, 
like emotional tie to that plus this idea that like he's aging himself so like creating a better world for like a future generation is something right. that is a theme that has come up in his films before some of the character tropes i feel like were similar to characters that we've seen before which wasn't not a bad thing but um like creativity choices with like the birds being like a focus i thought was interesting but yeah, it's, I guess it's hard. It's hard to talk about a film that I don't know necessarily. Like, I still don't really have like a good. I don't really know what I watched. <laughs> in a way, it's hard it's, to explain because it's there's parts of the plot that I wouldn't say they're holes, but they're there's feels like there was a couple things missing. Yeah, and um, I don't know. I guess you're right. I guess it's this journey about like grief and. PTSD and like how how you work through that and um we've seen a lot of Ghibli films where it's like someone working through like a death or like um you know younger kids and like they either don't have parents or parents are sick stuff like that and I don't know it I mean I will say like it was so nice to go from oh because the last movie we had watched was Earwig, Earwig and the and Witch. When the movie started, I was like, oh, it's such like a breath of yeah. fresh air because I hear, I knew, I didn't actually know that Joe Hisaishi was doing the oh, music, okay. but as soon as it yeah. started playing, I was like, oh, that's, act- I like, that must be him. Um, and so it was refreshing to kind of get back to the things about Studio Ghibli that I like, the elements that I enjoy. I don't know. I think it it's nice to, like get a character who gets like the main focus like it did feel like a character study Mm -hmm. and like a a progression of one character and and had a lot of interactions with different uh people i almost felt like there were like too many side characters there were a lot of side characters yeah like i felt like they were trying to maybe do too much like it just felt like maybe if you had one or two less side characters it would have been better because it got a little bit not even confusing, but it just felt like a little bit rushed through some of the characters. Yeah. Um, I think that's fair. And so, yeah, I think there was some, like, issues with the plot. There was maybe a couple issues with, like, the writing, but I think the story itself was pretty good. Obviously, I think the animation was good and the music soundtrack was good. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think... I'm kind of with you. I don't really know how to feel about it, and I also don't know how I'm going to rank it. Yeah, that's what I'm... Most got to figure out is where I'm going to rank it. Two things I wanted to note. One is uh, I completely agree with you when um, comparing this to the last film we had to watch, which is Earwig and the Witch, which Breath of Fresh Air. And it was something that I noticed when I was watching it is there's a scene where they're eating. And I was like, I like felt a swell where I'm like, the food, it looks so Uh, good. Because that was something we talked about in the last film is that it was like, it looked so bad. Like food looked. Because Ghibli's done food well so so it's like, often. oh, we're back. We're back at it. That food looks we're delicious. Back. And then the other thing I wanted to bring up is um, I didn't write this quote down and I wanted to find it because um, I thought that it was interesting is they held a preview screening for this film in February. And at the end credits, a message from Miyazaki was read out saying, quote, Perhaps you didn't understand it. I myself don't understand it. So I feel like it's pretty clear to me that he wasn't necessarily intending to write like a a traditional story. Yeah. I feel like it's very much based out of emotion and like feeling and understanding, which is totally fine. But it makes it I feel like that is kind of maybe harder for me to figure out how I feel about it because I got to kind of like grasp like what what meaning does it does it bring to me i guess is the right maybe the way i'd phrase that yeah and i guess it's like true to life that it a lot of times it's hard to understand and it doesn't always make sense and i get that it's also like yeah i think it's one of those films where everyone can kind of find some way to interpret right. it differently and everyone can kind of find some aspect of it to relate to which i think studio ghibli has always kind of done that well but yeah, I mean, I'd say like overall, like I enjoyed it. I teared up yeah. at the end. Um, I felt positively about the experience. Yeah. 
uh, there was oh, there's a part where they got this large fish and Hannah had the one of the most visceral reactions I've ever heard from her at a movie theater. There's this pirate, um, I can't remember her name, but she's like a sailor pirate. I really liked her character. She was probably one of my favorite. Yeah. She was probably my favorite side character in the film. Um, what a surprise! Mm-hmm. A, a fun female character, strong, strong female. female character. You know, we love those. He loves those. We're we're a big it. fan of that. Um, still holds up in this movie. And she she's gutting this fish, and so Amahito, she's like, "Here, you do it." And he goes to stab, and just gets sprayed with blood. And Hannah, I just hear Hannah go, Ugh. <laughs> "It was so gross." I I just could I couldn't stop laughing. Very gross. It was so funny. I have to imagine that you reacting is, like, how I reacted to Bao. Like, where I just, like, oh, gasped. Yeah. Where I was like... <gasps> <laughs> yeah. I forgot mm. about how weird that was. That's what it made me you know, think else of. in the theater, like, was concerned. Me and Alyssa were just like, what is happening? Like, what is happening? But, so that was really fun. You should know by now listening to us that we go through everything. We're going to do spoilers. We're going to talk about it all. Yeah. During the film, I was trying to figure out what the relationship between him and his stepmother were mm-hmm. was in relation to, like, his family, because it's, like, your bloodline. You're part of this bloodline of this family who has access to this, less, like, other world through this tower that's on their family property. And I kept being, like, is his stepmom his aunt? I just, like, was trying to figure that out. And then at the very end of the movie, they were like, it came to be that, like, yes, that his new stepmom is his mother's younger sister. And I was just, like, trying to piece that together. I was like, why does, like, what is happening? And I was like, I wondered if it was maybe supposed to be somewhat ambiguous, like, you weren't necessarily supposed to know that until the end of the film. I wasn't really sure, though. Yeah, I don't know, because I knew, I guessed that when they first met her. yeah. So I wasn't sure. I was like, so, is it, is it supposed know. to be ambiguous? Am I supposed to know that? And I just missed, like, the cue or something? Yeah, I'm not I wasn't sure. exactly sure. The soundtrack was good, but I found it interesting that there was... I felt like a lot more moments of silence in this film than maybe in some of his previous films, which I thought worked in a lot of cases. Like, I thought a lot of the moments where they were pretty soft and silent, like, worked pretty well. And I definitely noticed... Going back to the ties to his previous films, when there's, like, this um, gateway to this, I don't know, the grand uncle's, like, little place where he's stacking blocks, you know, he's building Legos, um, where it it looks like the train station from uh, Spirited Away. Like, when her um, yeah. Chihiro and her family walk into, the, like, that entrance and into the train station, that entryway looked exactly like that one. And I was like, oh, that's definitely got to be a callback to Spirited Away. Like, that was, like, I caught onto that right away. And I'm like, interesting. Interesting choice. Yeah. yeah. We have to talk about Hannah. What the fuck is Robert Patterson doing? How yeah. did he pull that voice out of himself? I knew he was in the yeah. voice cast, and then I was like, who is he? Because I, so I knew he was in the voice cast, and I knew Willem Dafoe was in the voice cast. And I didn't know who the, who was voicing who. I just had saw some of the names, and I'm like, cool. I thought the heron, this bird, was Willem Dafoe the whole fucking movie. Because it sounded like him. Like, it sounded like Green Goblin. And then I kept being like, oh, I wonder which bird is the Robert Pattinson bird. I'm like, maybe it's this one parakeet. Like, it maybe could be him. And he's maybe got, like, a little bit of British thing going on. Imagine my surprise. We get to the end of the film. We get to the credits. The Grey Heron, Robert Pattinson. I was like, what the fuck? I was like, how did he do that? I mean, he did Batman, so who's to say he can't do he anything? He sounds like, I, I couldn't believe it. I was like, get this man, yeah, get this was... man voice acting. Like, he needs to do more. This is his first voice acting role ever. Yeah. And apparently he had this voice already. Like, when he went to audition, he recorded that voice on his phone. And was like, oh, I kind of, like, have an idea of what voice I want to do. Can I play it for you? And they were like, oh, yeah, that's the voice. That's what we want. Like, sure, you can have it. Like... You know? I feel like he'll end up being in a bunch of animated stuff. Probably. Now. This was his this was his introduction. When they were trying to get the voice cast, this is also I was reading a different article. Um, they kind of have a running list of like 
actors that have expressed interest in working with the studio. Like, clearly, um, Mark Hamill has worked with the studio. Christian Bale has. So, like, some of the actors in this film had already worked with them previously. But apparently they have, like, people, agents have been like, hey, if anything comes up, uh, Mm -hmm. my client would be interested. So they kind of have a, I think Robert Pattinson was one of those people who was, like, expressed interest in being in the film. So, yeah, I thought that was very interesting. But, uh, yeah, we watched in English, if that wasn't clear, uh, in the theater. There were no subtitles, which that also was upsetting to me to not have access to subtitles, which is fine. It's fine. Yeah. I'll make do. They did, um, just for, like, note the people who don't know, they do offer the subbed and the dubbed version. They do have the option to see, at least in the theater we went to, that you could have seen it in Japanese, like, Which with I subtitles. thought was kind of cool. Because I assumed, I kind of assumed they would only do the English right. dubbed version for the theater re- release, and then when they did on HBO, or sorry, on Max. Yeah, offer both. They would offer both, but it was cool to see that they offered the subbed version. I agree. It was very, I don't know if it was just me, but it was very quiet. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I had a hard time hearing some of it, and I don't know if that was just the theater not having the volume loud enough, because I was like, at the beginning, I was like, I can't hear. Yeah, I think it was probably yeah. more the theater than the film itself would be my guess, right. but. But yeah, um, so I thought that was interesting. I feel like I'm interested in why, for an international release, they decided to change the name to The Boy and the Heron, because I don't really feel like the Heron is a main character, Like, I think from that title, I would expect that it's, like, the boy and a heron together on this journey, but more the heron's just kind of a in-and-out character. Like, they do things, some things together, and he is, like, a, you know, an important side character, but I was like, I don't really feel like the story is necessarily focused on the boy and the heron. I kind of like How Do You Live Better, I'm just going to be honest. Yeah. But that's just me. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't have anything else if you want to do favorites. Yeah, I don't think I had anything specific. Um, okay. Yeah. This is hard, because my favorite character, I think, was Mahito. I agree. But I really liked the woman pirate. I think her name was, um, let me look up her name, actually. Kiriko. 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 I'm not sure what her, like, old right uh she was old and maid or something she was like a maid yes i really liked her and um mahito's like interactions um that was my favorite part of the story was them together yeah i think they had really good back and forth and and stuff and you could tell they like cared about each other they just like didn't outwardly show it Mm -hmm. um yeah so but i think I, i think i picked him just because this is kind of a movie that's like a character study on him. And I think it's hard to not pick those characters in that instance. Yeah. Just because you kind of get this this whole slew of of everything he's going through and his emotions and how he processes everything. So um, I thought he was a pretty well done uh, main character. I agree. I picked him as well. And I, I agree because it is like kind of an autobiographical study. I feel like. Miyazaki did of almost of himself in a fantasy world kind of or he drew a lot of inspiration from his own life so it's hard to not pick the focal character in that case right um I agree I did really like Kiriko uh the pirate ship lady as well she's probably my second favorite character definitely my favorite side character from the movie yeah but I feel like I liked that um Mahito was like was a flawed character one he's 12 and he's dealing with the grief of his mother's death plus his dad remarrying his aunt who he doesn't know very well and has to move and that's during war so it's uh i think it's implied to be during like world war ii is when the time frame of this movie takes place so it's interesting to see like his growth and like his journey throughout the story and like processing grief and trauma and you know PTSD and all of that and um I like what like what struggles he goes through and like how yeah. he is able to like overcome and I guess become become himself I guess is maybe the right way to phrase that. Yeah. By the end of the yeah. film. Okay. Um, so I did not have a favorite line, mostly just because I couldn't remember I couldn't any remember lines. lines either. I also didn't have a favorite line either, no. Okay. Favorite scene. This one's hard because there were a couple scenes that really, like, stuck in my mind. Um, but I think if we're talking about just specific scene, I really actually liked the scene with 
can't remember if it was like towards the beginning or if it was in the middle. It's like when he's oh, when he falls asleep and he's having like flashbacks, dreams of his yeah. mom. Mm-hmm. And not only did I really like like the animation style they did, but I just thought it was like a really like profound thing, and it really like allowed the viewer, I think, to try and understand how the character's feeling and kind of what he went through as like a child, essentially. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, so I just really liked that, how they did that and how they showed that, like, emotion through a scene. It really invoked the, um, that scene from the Tale of Princess uh, Cayuga, Mm -hmm. where she's, like, running and then the animation becomes, like, very, kind of almost different. Like, I feel like this had a similar vibe. Not in the same way, but I felt like it did a really good job of, like, displaying emotion through animation. Because I felt like it was, became very wispy and, like shadowy like the the color kind of changed the way the fire yeah. looked looked it, it was very well done i agree i was trying to decide if i wanted that to be my favorite ghibli moment or if i wanted that to be my favorite scene yeah because they kind of felt like it overlapped a bit there Agreed. so i think i ended up let me check i think yeah i put that as my favorite scene as well because I, I was okay. i knew i was going back and forth so yeah i agree the same same reasons that you do i thought it was a really impactful scene and like i feel like Especially seeing something in the theater and seeing it for the first time. Stuff that sticks with you is, like, the things that, like, are impactful. So that one is a scene, like, I can, like, I can, like, picture that. On, and also, I feel like it was also, feels a little different to see it on a big screen, too. Yeah. Because that kind of made it more interesting. Because, I mean, we've True. been watching it just at home. So. Right. It makes it maybe feel a little, a little special as well. Yeah. So for Ghibli moment... There was a part where the music started coming in, and I can't remember, like, I tried to look up what the song was, but I couldn't, like, I didn't know There what were 36 was. songs in the soundtrack. Yeah, it was so, hard to find the so, song, and also I pulled yeah. up a list, and I was like, I don't know which one's which. Um, but there was a part towards the end when um, they were talking about, like, if you stay in his great grand uncle oh yeah like the created world right they were kind of discussing like if you stay and like create your own world that you can make like the best of whatever Mm -hmm. he's saying like you can make it the best possible world or like if you leave and go back and there was like a part where like this music came in and it was just like i don't know that that created world like this the final couple scenes where it was like the the blocks and all that like that whole part like i really thought that the I liked the animation of that, and I also kind of liked the, um, it kind of gave me vibes of, like, Harry Potter and Dumbledore in that white yeah. room, subway station kind of thing that they did to one of the last movies. I agree. that Yeah, that's a good comparison. Yeah. That. And, um, I don't know. I just, I thought, because I was also going to do the Ghibli scene as the one mm-hmm. I just did, but there were so many of the scenes that you could have said Ghibli moments because they were so, like, entwined. Um, but yeah, I just liked how they did that aspect and how he was like oh he made a comment about i can't remember what it was but that he basically knew that the great uncle was like lying or like Mm -hmm. had some sort of bad intention stuff like that um yeah so i just i just liked that and i liked how there was kind of like this parallel i could see to another movie and i don't know just it's not even so much about the scene but like how the way that it made me feel yeah the emotion I yeah, got. Yeah, the emotion it. behind it. Yeah. Um because around that moment, around that time is when I like started to tear up a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Not right then, but like soon after. So yeah, I just I like that little build up scene. Yeah. I agree. I thought that scene was really good. It's not the one I ended up picking, but I know what music you're talking about with that scene. Yeah. It, it and it also I feel like a lot of the music, not not that it's a detriment, but I feel like a lot of it kind of sounds pretty similar. Yeah. It's kind of like How's Moving Castle where they kind of use the same theme right. in slightly different ways throughout the film. It kind of felt more like that style than some of the other um, grand, more grandiose, like, you know, uh, prin- uh, Princess Mononoke type feels. Right. That was something I kind of brought up earlier, but I forgot to bring it up again, is that um, some people are saying that it, I don't know if Miyazaki himself said it or if people are reading into that, that people saw, like, um, Takahata as that character, as this, like, family member who has passed and is like to the next generation or whatever so i thought that was interesting but uh the scene that i ended up picking is 
uh, Kiriko basically picks him up. They go on a ship. They catch a fish, and then they're um, sailing into this like town mm-hmm. harbor, and it's like this really cool looking like ship house, like very very visual styled. That I was like, oh, I'm in. I'm like, I'm into this this style, this visual. And there was like kind of these like souls almost that were following them, and there was music kind of playing during that scene. And I thought that felt like very, all the scenes that I tend to like are very much like that. Because it felt like the sixth station from like um, Spirited Away when they're just traveling and it's just kind of like seeing what's happening in the background and just kind of following them Mm -hmm. uh, without really a lot of words. Um, And so that felt really good to me, like that scene. And then also the cute little puffballs showed up, and I was like, oh, oh look at those little I puffballs. I want one of those. They were so cute. They were so cute. Looked like little, uh, what are those, squishmallows or whatever they're called. They looked like a mixture of boo and toad. Yeah, they were very cute. Oh, they were so cute. Wara Wara is what they're called. The oh. Wara Wara. They were very cute. Um, so I was like, oh, this is like Totoro. They're so cute. Like the little dust bunnies from, yeah, um, yeah from like Spirit Away and stuff, so... But there were there were several scenes that I like felt were pretty powerful and strong yeah, and like invoked a lot of emotion. And I think that's probably what my biggest takeaway is from having seen this is that I don't know cohesively as a story if it's like my favorite, but I feel mm-hmm. like it does really well in like emotional and like yeah, bringing out some sort of like feeling or um I don't know what the other word I'm looking for is. Maybe a like how you t- decide to interpret it. Maybe is the way right. that I would I would describe that. I feel like it invoked a lot of emotions and like ability to interpret scenes how you want to and stuff like that. Yeah, I feel like wherever I rank it, I probably I'm gonna have to rewatch it, and then that might change how I feel about it because I just I don't know where to put it. <laughs> I don't know where to put it, yeah. Hannah. I don't know. Yeah, that's fair. But yeah, we did it. We're done. We watched our final film. And now, Hannah, we have the monstrous task of ranking every single film, (sighs) which is 23, 24 now. It's 24 24. total. Uh, Yeah, so we will be back next episode and we'll be ranking. And it will be the same as our Pixar where we just have one full episode of ranking because it's going to take that long. Yep. In addition to that, we're going to have a nice little special guest come join us for the ranking. A new special guest. A new special guest, yeah. Not a returning special guest. Not a returning guest, a new guest. And um, because I wanted to spare her (laughs) for not having to do all of the work that we've had to do with all these episodes, I said, hey, do you want to just come to rank? And she said, sounds good. A year and a half ago (laughs) when we were going to do this. So she has agreed to come for real now in the present day. So look forward to that. Um. Yeah. But yeah. So uh, yeah, we have social media. Our three podcasts mm-hmm. at gmail dot com is our Gmail account. Uh, let us know if you have any questions, comments, concerns. We have an Instagram account. We have a letterbox that I am over the holiday break going to be slowly updating and adding some lists and things. So that'll be a bit more interactive if um, you're into letterbox. Um. But yeah. yeah. Do you have anything else? No, just stay classy. Yeah. Go fuck yourselves, San Diego. Go fuck yourself, Cash. No, I'm oh. Just Ooh, st- st- at home. Uh, we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. I'm sorry, Cash, I didn't mean that. We would like to thank Joseph McDade for our intro music. He provides free music available for all kinds of creative use. The song that we used is called Sunrise Expedition, and you can find it and his other music on his website, josephmcdade.com. If you would like to reach us, you can email us at r3podcasts at gmail.com. That's r, the number three, p-o-d-c-a-s-t-s at gmail.com. Or you can find us on Instagram by searching research rank repeat. I wrote my notes after my actual thoughts on the film that I recorded. So I went to look and I just heard, saw the word fish. And I'm like, that's not the start of my notes. So I got confused. Oh, hi, Carl. Look, look at the cute boy. Pew, 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 pew.